Hello, and welcome to Now Where Were We? A series of short videos about the history of Olympia, Lacey, and surrounding areas. Your host for this program is Deborah Ross. In this series, Deb takes us to locations that inform us about the history of our community. She also visits with local historians. We welcome your feedback and suggestions. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Now Where Were We?, an ongoing series of short videos about the history of Olympia, Lacey, and surrounding areas. My name is Deborah Ross, and today we are once again at the Port of Olympia, at the Marine Terminal. You can see behind me that much of the business of the Marine Terminal is export of logs to foreign and domestic ports. But today I'm going to be talking more about the history of wood products in the Port of Olympia and particularly focusing on the first half of the 20th century. First, a brief history of the wood products industry in our area. The first American arrivals to the Olympia area, the Michael T. Simmons Party, immediately recognized its potential and established a sawmill on Tumwater Falls. From then on, sawmills were a regular feature of our landscape. The 1879 bird's eye view that we've seen in previous episodes shows a mill on Swantown Slough, near the base of Bud Inlet. In the late 1800s, Charles Springer and Alan White founded the Springer and White Manufacturing Facility, which was a vertically integrated business that owned raw timber as well as manufacturing building components and shipping facilities, and then used the discarded pulp for heating. That was the genesis, in fact, of the Acme Fuel Company, which is still in business today. The 1920s saw the advent of the plywood and veneer business, which became one of Olympia's most important industries for decades. Olympia Veneer was founded in 1921 and made several innovations in the plywood and veneer manufacturing process. It was also an early example of a cooperatively owned business Many workers were Scandinavian in origin. Because all employees were owners, several homes throughout Olympia are noted as being built by the owners of Olympia Veneer. A few years later, in 1924, the Washington Veneer Company arrived in Olympia. In 1929, Washington Veneer inaugurated its new smokestack by staging a wedding on its top as a publicity stunt. The plywood and veneer businesses were important to our economy, but also made major contributions to the war effort, as much war materiel was made of plywood. Eventually, both Olympia Veneer and Washington Veneer were sold, Olympia Veneer to the St. Paul and Tacoma Lumber Company, and Washington Veneer to Georgia Pacific. Georgia Pacific built its iconic headquarters using plywood both inside and out. Rich wood veneers lined the offices. The building is one of the last vestiges of this once robust industry and is on the National Register of Historic Places. But by the late 1960s, all plywood and veneer plants were gone from the Port of Olympia. To learn about what the port area was like and the wood products industry in the early part of the 20th century, I met with Bill Jacobs, a longtime Olympia resident. We met at Baddorf and Bronson, located where the plants once spewed out smoke and steam from their stacks. I'm here with Bill Jacobs, 
who is a former commissioner with the city of Olympia. And I understand that that is the former title of what's now Olympia Council members. Is that right? That's right. I was on the, in fact, it was the last uh, city commission that, that existed. Yeah. What years did you serve? Oh, gosh. I think the, uh, it was 1981 and then f the four years prior to that. And we're talking to you today because you grew up here in Olympia, is that right? I did. I lived at 913 Glass Street, which was and is directly across the street from the Big Glow Historical House. And I lived there for first grade, second grade, third grade, and, and part of the fourth. Well, you certainly have seen a ton of changes in Olympia from the time that you were growing up here to today. And today we want to talk to you about what you remember about this location here where we're sitting uh, in the port of Olympia, and particularly about uh, the factories that were down here. So tell me a little bit about your memories of what the Port of Olympia was like when you were a boy. Knowing that you and I were going to talk today, I walked by that State Street where those plants used to be, which is now largely vacant land. And in many respects, it, it's as it was then. Uh, some of the dealership across the street are not the same ones, but they're the same buildings, and they're in the same business. The service station that's on the corner there is a Shell service station, I think. There was a service station there then, when I was a little kid, because I remember driving, riding my bike around the corner, and by mistake, I went too close to a sign and knocked it down, and it terrified me that the owner of the station was in a do something bad to me. And that was there, and then a block away where there is now an espresso called the filling station was an honest to goodness gas station and repair place. I remember it was operated by Emil, Emil Harps. And uh, I remember seeing him there. I remember seeing him pump gas there. I remember seeing uh, the second building in back where he repaired cars. It was an active, active place and that's still there. Kitty corner from that is the Eagles, which was there then, across the street, the Bigelow Apartments, which was there then. So there's a lot of things that remain the same. One thing is you drive, uh, walk along uh, East Bay Drive in that area is what you used to look at. It would be uh, a, par a part, at least, of the old veneer plant uh, as a yacht basin. And there wasn't a yacht or a boat anywhere close in those days. Remember, a lot of mud flats, it's still that way now. But you noticed it more because there wasn't much else around that area. And uh, I can remember seeing a lot of, um, I don't know what you call them, silo-like tanks of uh, 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 gas and oil companies that were down here. And um, I, I can remember uh, walking on East Bay Drive down from Glass Street where we lived and there was this long, long wooden building and that was the Olympia Veneer plant and that faced State Street. I almost c kind of remember it as two separate buildings but I'm not sure that's accurate. But It was a huge building but you couldn't see inside and so you didn't, you were just kind of vaguely aware that it was there and there was a lot of activity of people coming and going. And I remember it particularly came to my attention one time when I was walking by and there were a lot of people out in front and they had these burn tanks, iron barrels, uh, with fire in them to keep themselves warm. And they were in some kind of a labor dispute way back then. But a lot of people worked there. I didn't have any direct relatives that did, but it, and of course, we need to remember that that was during the Depression. And so it was a place where a lot of young people right out of high school would try to get a job there because uh, they needed a job and they weren't going on to college at the time. That was in the 30s. You know, what, what I remember most about that time was people looking for jobs and good jobs. And of course, the veneer plant uh, was one of the great ones. And, one thing I never thought about at the time was 
there was a wood products business. And the wood products business in this state was one of the largest growing businesses then, and it had been for maybe 50, 60 years. Lo and behold, when I returned from Washington, D.C., I was in my 60s, I become executive director of a statewide group of forest landowners. And all those many years later, as I'm representing them, it's still the number one business in the state of Washington. It varies between one and two. And I was always so impressed with that because uh, businesses and products come and go, but forest products, one way or another, have remained a central part of uh, our industry and a central part of Olympia uh, from the first day I can remember anything until today. Well, thank you so, so much for coming down and sharing your memories of uh, Olympia during the Depression and the years after and, and sharing your time with us. I really, really appreciate it. I'm happy to do it. You know, it was a wonderful time. One of the things that I love to, to, to still do is go to downtown Olympia, and it's still a thriving place, and to go down to where we are now, which is an extension really of downtown and what a new and uh, modern part of uh, Olympia it is. You know, if I could add one thing to the historic times that I sometimes mention, uh, I went to Washington School when I lived in Glass Street, and then when we moved out in the country, I went to a two-room schoolhouse called Hayes. And when I went to high school, I went to Olympia High School. And what was so remarkable about that time was it was the only high school in the area, the only one. So every kid that grew up in Olympia got acquainted at Olympia High School because they came from the city schools, the rural schools, everywhere. And it was, there was something about that that was special. No spaghetti bowl back then. Oh, no, there was no crosstown rivalry. Uh, the big rivalry was with uh, Aberdeen, Centralia, Chehalis, Longview, that kind, of, that kind of competition. Well, thanks again. Really appreciate it. And it was great to get acquainted and uh, enjoy our coffee. Thank you very thanks much. Thanks to Bat, Dorf, and Bronson. <laughs>